G'day again and welcome back to Aviation Map Reading. This is part four of the five part series, but the, the last part of the navigation component of it. Today we're going to talk about satellite navigation, the global navigation satellite system, commonly known as GPS, some various apps and some deductive uh, reckoning for um, airborne map reading. So how does the GNSS work? Well, what a little bit on the history. During the Cold War, um, the Department of Defense in the United States wanted to be able to pinpoint where a submarine was so they could then launch an intercontinental ballistic missile. Now, prior to that, they had been using a system called Doppler. Doppler is basically a radar, and it will follow a moving object, or if you're a moving object yourself, it can be used to track the relative motion of the ground. Now, that doesn't help if you're in a submarine. So what they decided to do was to create a satellite system to allow for ease of location of various things on the surface of the Earth. So they created the Navigation System Using Timing and Ranging Global Positioning System, known as the NAVSTAR GPS. Love those acronyms in the military. So it was a global navigational satellite system, the GNSS, and it was 24 active satellites in orbit, and these satellites are known as space vehicles. Now, how does the system work? Well, it uses a system called trilateration, which means what it does, instead of using um, bearings to get a position, it'll use a distance. So a space vehicle will broadcast a signal at a particular time, and it'll be measured against a, uh, an extremely accurate onboard clock, an atomic clock. The GPS receiver will then detect the signal, and it'll compare the signal's receipt with its own clock. And so it does the following calculation. If distance equals velocity times time, then the distance will equal the speed of light times the time taken to reach the receiver. Because the space vehicle transmitted a radio signal, and radio signals um, travel at the speed of light, that's a constant. So, so now the only variable is the time. If, they can, <clears throat> if the system can figure out the time the signal was sent versus the time the signal was received, and that speed of light or speed of radio signal is constant, then they can measure the distance by multiplying the velocity times the time. Therefore, if the pulse took 0 0.004 seconds to reach receiver, and there's the speed of light, then the GPS receiver must be 0 0.004 times the speed of light in meters, and the result is 1,199,169 meters from the space vehicle, or 1,199 kilometers away. So the system needs at least three space vehicles uh, and from those three space vehicles a position on Earth can be calculated. If you have four space vehicles you can actually get a, an altitude as well. So that diagram there shows you some space vehicles um, looking at a roving receiver, that funny looking bloke with an antenna on his back. And by trilateration, those space vehicles can give the receiver its position on the ground, and the fourth space vehicle will give you a height above a reference point, which we'll talk about soon. So how does it tell its altitude? Well, it uses a, a theoretical sphere, which we uh, spoke about in a previous part. It's called a spheroid. And so it's not actually using sea level as the reference. Now this spheroid uh, was updated in 1984 uh, via the World Geodetic System. Uh, WGS84 is its acronym, and it provides the reference for vertical, um, vertical distance, i.e. Uh, altitude. So if you're going to be looking at altitude on your GPS, you need to make sure that it's referencing the WGS84 datum and you can change that in the settings page. Now there are a number of different receivers but all of them have similar functions so we'll have a look at a few of them and you can see that even though they are different in uh, their construct and different in their brands etc they'll all basically have similar functions on similar pages so get to know those functions and it'll, be, make, it, it'll make your job easier. So Garmin is probably the most famous brand on the planet. Um, the ones that you may find uh, in use quite often are the GPS map series, 
the Aero 500 series or the GNS 400 and 500 series which are usually uh, mounted in aircraft. Here are some images of the various uh, Garmin receivers. Here's the, um, where are we? There's the GPS map 76 and the map 96. Uh, those are very small receivers. Uh, the Aero 500, um, it's more of an aviation style receiver, but it's not mounted in the actual aircraft console. It's, it's portable. And this here is the uh, Garmin 430, which is a very common aviation uh, GPS that you'll find in a lot of aircraft. Now, smartphones have an integrated GPS receiver. And what it does, it actually uses mobile phone towers to assist it. It's known as assisted GPS. Now, if you are outside the range of the towers, uh, sometimes it will take a significant length of time for the GPS to lock onto the satellites. 30 seconds per satellite is what they average, and there are 24 satellites. So you could actually take you 12 and a half minutes for the GPS to receive uh, its signals and to clarify exactly where it is. But there's a thing in the receiver called an almanac, so it knows what space vehicles it's likely to find from a rough idea of where it thinks it is. So it'll, it, it shouldn't take you 12 and a half minutes to uh, lock on to a GPS signal, but sometimes it can take a number of minutes. A lot of the smartphone apps can integrate maps or satellite pictures um, uh, with the information that it gets from the GPS, uh, as well as a compass. So it actually makes it quite a useful little device. So that's why we're going to talk about it now. Here are some screenshots of uh, the Apple um, Apple Maps and also the Apple uh, Compass rows. Something interesting on the Apple program here it provides you with latitude and longitude very useful but there are better apps that can that can uh, you display this information in much more useful ways so what sort of information can it give us well the most important information is the present position but it can also give you other information such as well how many satellites it can see and its signal strength information about any waypoints that you want to travel to ground speed and some navigation information. So depending on the, the GPS, it could be a track error or distance and bearing and time or elapsed time estimates. Here are a couple of pages from the GPS map series and also the Aero 500 showing you the space vehicles. So let's have a look at what the information is that's presenting. Well, it's got your speed at this stage here. It's not uh, stationary and the elevation and the accuracy of your position, so within 29 feet, which for aviation is fine. Here's a, a picture of the sky and the satellites that it's actually looking at, and the signal strength of, from those satellites. Gives you the date and the time, and of course the location in latitude, in, uh, latitude and longitude, in degrees, minutes, decimal. Now this one here, this is the Aero 500, provides you basically the same information. What satellites you can see, the relative strength of the satellites, your ground speed, altitude, and degree of accuracy, as well as your present position. So when you're displaying information, a user can change the different items to make it more useful. And so as a user of GPS, the important stuff that you need to do is understand your units of measurement and what data fields you can put on the different pages of your GPS. So in Australia, we use the metric system, except in certain fields. And those fields are aviation, navigation, and altitude. So when you are involved in aviation, your altitude is always going to be in hundreds of feet, and your um, distances and uh, speeds will normally be in nautical miles per hour, or knots. Um, and... So how do we do it? Well, we look for the tools or the setup pages, or also known as settings. Make sure your GPS is in the correct data, which is WGS84. Then check your units of measurement. So normally we go for degrees, minutes, decimal. Right there, degrees, minutes, decimal, or MGRS. So those are the two most common. If you are trying to give information to the pilot, that's what he needs. 
If you're going to be referring to a topper map, that's what you need. Check your speed units. If you're going to be talking to the pilot, then he'll want that in knots. Uh, check your time. It'll either be UTC, Universal Time Coordinated, or UTC plus an offset. And so for Eastern Australia, uh, not in daylight saving time, it's plus 10 hours. During daylight saving time, it's plus 11 hours. And then magnetic variation is it on or off. And sometimes it'll give you the option of do you want it to be automatic? In which case, yes, choose yes for automatic. So here are some setup pages. Let's have a look at what it's showing you. Well, time format, that's telling you if it's gonna be 24 hour clock. Is there an offset on UTC? Well, it's got it off, but if I did want to put it on, the offset will be plus 10. Here's the date and here's the time. In the um, position setup page, here's the location format that I want. Degrees, minutes, decimal. The map datum is WGS84. My magnetic variation is automatic and it's already detected that my variation is eight degrees east for the area that I'm in. Having a look at the map series, same deal. Position format, degrees, minutes, decimal, WGS84. Uh, here the, it shows that the distance is going to be in statute miles. We want to change that to nautical miles or if you're going to be over the ground using a top of map, you want kilometers. Uh, vertical speed, yeah, you want that in feet. Depth, well, it's not a big deal for us, but yes, feet. Temperature will be in Celsius for us and pressure is millibars. Uh, here's another one here from a, the map series, 24 hours. They've got time zone here. They've got central, which is a United States time zone. So we'll change that to Eastern Australia or plus 10. Daylight saving times, well, that will automatically detect like daylight saving time because that's common around the world. Current date, current time. So all those settings there can all be changed. So when we are actually navigating, here are some common fields that we would like to be able to have presented for our immediate use. So looking at the data fields, there's a compass ring, and uh, we have a thing called a course pointer and two from indicator, bug indicator. This thing here is known as an HSI, horizontal situation indicator, and for pilots, it's, it's very common use. Whereas over here, it's like a compass. So that one there is, is very useful for pilots. Um, you can, if you're not a pilot, you can still use it, um, but it's got some extra information there that's that's useful for track uh, uh, track maintenance. Uh, data fields we've got here with speed in knots, KT is knots. Distance to next waypoint is in nautical miles, NM is nautical miles. Your flight timer, so you can just press uh, a button and it'll start counting up, and the time of day. So when you're doing navigation, that is very useful. Over here, we've got a slightly different amount of information. We have speed in miles per hour, distance to next in miles, the ETA at your next destination in local time. 12.37 p.m. is when you expect to arrive at your destination. And this here is your elapsed time estimate to next. So you'll be there in one minute and 28 seconds. And there's the direction that you want to travel. Here is some more information about data fields. This is from the Aero 500 series. Uh, this one here has the fields on the outer parts of the page, a ground speed, distance to the next waypoint, which is 172 nautical miles, current time, and the track that you're tracking, which is repeated up here. You can see you're tracking 077 magnetic, and that is the direction of the aircraft. That little triangle is pointing in the direction that the aircraft is looking at. Uh, this this gives you a, a basic map, so you know that over to your 2 o'clock there's some high ground. You should be able to see some high ground directly in front of you, and over to your left there's an island there, and that's actually Magnetic Island. Here on uh, on this page, we've got some slightly different information, uh, but exactly uh, in the same locations uh, depicted. So ground speed, distance to next waypoint, the name of the next waypoint, and the current time. And it's got my track and a little picture of an aeroplane there. These things here, you might remember from a previous uh, airborne navigation um, modules, is uh, restricted use airspace. So when would you use a present position page on your GPS? Well, if you're doing air observation or um, uh, air attack, operations, especially for the Rural Fire Service or State Emergency Services or any other emergency service, um, 
The present, page, present position page is incredibly useful. It's invaluable. So you've got to make sure, as we said before, that the system that you're going to be using matches the maps you're going to use. So if you're using aeronautical charts, you want latitude and longitude on your settings. But if you're using topo maps, you want MGRS. So here is the present position page. Now this one up here is the Aero 500. It's that portable um, aviation style GPS. And it's actually very, very good once you get the hang of it. The present position page tells me a lot of good information. It tells me my distance from a, a known waypoint and it will often default to the closest airport. So when you're flying around, that's a very useful thing to have. You want to know where you can get fuel or where you can divert in the event of an emergency. But it's uh, two nautical miles to the southeast and a bearing of a 129 degrees magnetic. It's giving me my location in MGRS as well as in latitude and longitude. That's fantastic. Tells me my altitude. Notice it says GPS altitude, so you know that it's referencing the WGS84 uh, spheroid. And it allows me to mark a waypoint by pressing that button. So that page there, fantastic. This page here, this is from the uh, GNS430, which is the aviation um, GPS you'll find in a lot of aircraft. It's telling me my track, ground speed, and my altitude. Tells me, uh, shows me uh, diagram diagrammatically where uh, my track is, uh, 074 magnetic, my current position and the current time, and the local airport to where the airport is and distance and sorry bearing and distance to the local airport and this is in the nav page and this page this little diagram down the bottom here shows to shows you that you've got seven pages and that's the nav page right there on the left it tells me what my active com frequency is and my active navigation frequency and what's on standby on the flip-flop this here is your gps uh, map series um, its present position page is that satellite page and it shows you the position as well as the satellites. So waypoints are the keys to navigating and also to reporting intelligence. So if you're doing a, a job where you need to be reporting what you see on the ground, hitting the, a key that's able to mark a waypoint and then annotating what the waypoint is, is what you need to, uh, to, to be able to do quickly so you can provide that intelligence back on the ground. So the way that you create a waypoint differs slightly between different receivers. And so I'll show you a few common functions that all receivers have. Um, some are easy to use, some are more intuitive than others. So let's have a look at a few. If you're using the GPS map um, series of GPSs, the way you mark a position is you press the mark slash enter button and hold it down. The present position which is showing on the on the screen will show up in the waypoint field and then you just assign a name. So that's how you mark a position that you're currently at. Now if you want to create a waypoint using the same series of, of GPS, you actually have to use similar uh, similar set of keystrokes. So if you want to create a user waypoint, mark your present position by using the procedure you used this, uh, earlier, which is hold that button in until the present position comes up. And then you need to go in and change the numbers in the coordinates, and then you can save it. You assign a name. So it's not that intuitive until you've done it a few times, then it makes sense. But uh, a lot of other receivers will actually allow you to mark a waypoint or to uh, create a waypoint. On the GPS map series, that's the, the button there. It's the mark enter button. Uh, for the pilots, uh, most people should, most pilots should know how to use the GNS430. So if for some reason you're in a cockpit and you're using the GNS430 to assist you with your navigating, and obviously the pilot doesn't need it, uh, what you have to do to um, enter a waypoint is to make sure you're in the nav page. So you turn the dial until you see that nav page come up. Then you press the uh, the push cursor button. Again, the present position will show. Press enter, and then it'll go to the user waypoint page, and then you can assign a name and save it. Now the pilot will have to show you how to use it because it does require a knowledge on how to use the cursor, and it can be a bit bit tricky. So here's the, the push cursor button. If you press that in, your present position will come up. 
and then you can actually save it. Now, as I showed you before, the Aero 500 GPS set is quite good. You make sure that it's in the present position page and that large button that I showed you before, Mark Waypoint, and then you'll get a default keyboard and allows you to assign a number. So there's that button. Once you press that, it will save this position here, and then you can assign a name to it, and then it's, it's, it uh, is saved in your Waypoint menu file. So how do you prepare your GPS? Well, first things first, make sure your GPS is in the same coordinate system as the map you're using, and you do that by the settings menu. Know how to quickly change between coordinate systems, latitude and longitude versus MGRS. The reason it's important to know that is you may be in the air and you, no, you may be on the ground or you may be working on a topo map and you have an MGRS coordinate and you need to pass on information to a pilot. Well, he's not going to have a topo map and he's not going to have time to punch in a, a UTM coordinate. If you give him a latitude and longitude, he's going to immediately have an idea as to where that's going to be and he can, without even looking at the, sorry, without even Touching the GPS, a good pilot should be able to fly to a latitude and longitude just based on the numbers. But um, if uh, the pilot wants to input it into the GPS, then latitude and longitude is the way that he's going to do it. Another thing you need to do is know how to mark a target and save it. I already showed you that one. That's uh, the Aero 500 uh, present position page. Now here's some apps. The best app you can get for an Apple smart device, whether it's the iPad or the iPhone, is the Motion X. So that's the current leader in GPS uh, apps and it provides waypoint navigation as well as tracking, allows you to convert coordinates quite easily, lat longs to UTM or to MGRS. It'll allow you to geotag photos too. So if you take a photograph, you've got a lot of that position information is located on the photograph. And that's great, you can go straight to Wikipedia, it's got a hot link to Wikipedia for tourists, or you can uh, geotag photos to Facebook if you are a social outcast. Here's some information on the pages of the uh, Motion X app for smartphones. So let's have a look at some of it. Here we have our latitude and longitude and the button to mark a waypoint. And there's buttons to share and a button to photograph things. It tells you the elevation uh, in meters here and the accuracy of your position in meters, your signal strength and uh, where your last position was. And then when you want to share it, you uh, assign a name, you can put in a comment and it'll give you the um, MGRS uh, grid coordinate for it as well. So. Motion X, fantastic piece of kit. So here is a photograph taken of this position and it's overlaid over Google Maps. So I've assigned the name Waypoint 2. There's Waypoint 2. Put in some notes there. It tells me when I was there and the, uh, the time. So that's the automatic default and some notes that I've put in. It's bearing, altitude and distance from a latitude and longitude. Unfortunately, Motion X is not available for Android Android devotion, uh, devices. There are a couple of others. Um, they're not too bad. Motion X is definitely the best, uh, but the Backcountry Navigator and uh, Polaris, or the upgraded version of Polaris known as GPS Waypoints Navigator, have similar functions, and some of them provide you with really good contour maps, uh, topo maps. Um, they all provide waypoint information. They all allow photos and with information attached to it. But uh, as I said, Motion X is the best. And uh, Backcountry and Polaris are, are good, but they're not as intuitive as Motion X. There are some screenshots on the left. Uh, the left one and the middle one are from the uh, GPS Waypoints Navigator program. The one on the right is from the Motion X uh, Correction, the Backcountry Navigator Program. Uh, some interesting information on these. This one here, that page tells you latitude and longitude. Tells you what heading your, um, your aircraft or where you're heading, but you're actually true heading as well. So there's uh, the difference there is you can see 206 to 214 means a variation of 8 degrees. 
this here shows that the compass is using um, the magnetometers on board the, the smart device. Tells me my accuracy, plus or minus 90 meters, which is you know, probably needed a few more space vehicles to give me better accuracy. It says my altitude is 66 meters. Uh, my speed in kilometers an hour and distance from my last waypoint and also the time since I hit the button to start the timer. This here is a satellite page telling me what space vehicles uh, signal strength I'm getting. This one here is actually from Backcountry Navigator as you can see it's following a track and there are a number of waypoints on that track that this person has has placed on there and you can geotag those waypoints and take photographs too. So when you are navigating in the aircraft, here are some tips for you. First things first, make sure your seating position is comfortable. Make sure that you are fully secure, that your harness is done up nice and tightly, and that you're in a position where it's going to give you the best visibility. So get rid of anything that's going to obstruct your visibility. Cross-check your position on the map with a GPS, and I'll, uh, I'll show you a technique that you can use for that later on. And keep your finger on the position, and track where you're going over the map with your finger. Make sure you orient your map with the aircraft's heading. Know where the compass or the what they know, call the remote magnetic indicator is on the aircraft's console and how to read it. And also find your compass slash HSI, horizontal situation indicator page on your GPS and know how to get to that as well. Let's have a look at some uh, map interpretations now. If you are looking at a map you need to orient the map so the direction you're traveling should be the um, up on the map so if you're tra traveling north well then north should be up if you're traveling east then east should be up you need to look at the map in three dimensions so first things first where's the high ground relative to your position where are other features and what directions are they oriented the higher you are the easier it is to read a map so a lot of the operations that you're going to be involved in is going to be at low level. So it's not going to be that easy to read the map. So it's very important to do a good map recce ahead of time and to keep tabs of where you are over the, uh, over the ground by looking at the map and um, using various tools to orient yourself. So when you see a significant feature, figure out where it is on the map, use it as a reference. And don't forget that you are traveling at a certain rate over the map and allow for that. You are no longer constrained by being on the ground and traveling only at 60 kilometers an hour or 40 kilometers an hour, whatever it might be. You're, if you're traveling at 100 knots, you are traveling uh, at three kilometers a minute. So that's very, very fast. You have to take that into account. Orient the map with the aircraft's heading and calculate the direction of features. So if the feature is at 10 o'clock from the aircraft, therefore you must be four o'clock from the feature. If you found that feature on the map, draw a line with your finger, four o'clock from it and it'll give you a rough estimate as to where you are. But here's another trick. Keep your present position page on your GPS and make sure it's in uh, an MGRS. Then use the first two digits of the northing and the first two digits of the easting to put you in a grid square. So in this case here, the MGRS is Delta Hotel, 55 Hotel, 20565 44324. The important numbers for me are these first two ones, 20, which is my easting, and 44, which is my northing. So coming across on my map, there's 20, and my northing is 44. I know I'm in this grid square. So when you are flying around at 100 knots, you're going to be traveling over three grid squares. So you'll be in there for 20 seconds. Now, if I'm heading on, if I look down on the compass and I see 090, that means I am tracking in that direction. So straight ahead of me, I should see a lake and I should see some high ground. So I can figure out exactly where I am. What will I see at my 10 o'clock? Well, I'll see Mount Byron. Now, sometimes we have, well, all the time we need to use uh, deductive reasoning or deductive reckoning, what's known as dead reckoning. So, as I said in the previous slide, have a look at the big features, figure out their orientation, and then try and find them on the map. I'll show you a couple of scenes, and I'll show you an aeronautical chart, the Townsville um, visual terminal chart, and see if you can find where you are. So what do you need to do? Well, look for terrain features and cultural features. Figure out the lines and the angles of all of those features, 
and then use some deductive reasoning to find out where the photo was taken from. So here is a VTC, the Townsville VTC. We've already covered maps and charts in previous uh, modules and uh, looked at the characteristics of a VTC. So I'll do a quick map recce. Okay, let's have a look. We have a coastline that's going northwest to southeast, significant island off the coast, magnetic island. There is the, uh, the city of Townsville. It has a river going through it and some higher ground to the south. Uh, it's got a number of VFR routes coming out of the, uh, the, run, the airfield. So that's something you need to be aware of in case there's other traffic coming in and out. Um, you got all the, the blue lines there representing airspace. The red lines are representing special use airspace. And that just gives me a bit of an idea of where things are in, in the Townsville area. Okay, now here is a picture that we need to try and ascertain um, the location thereof. Let's do some deductive reasoning. First of all, let's look for some big features. The most obvious one is this river. Okay, the river has a bit of a reach in it, a straight, air, a straight line, and then it turns to the right. Okay, so we're looking for an area where there's a bend. And where that bend is, is a weir. So there's a weir and a bend. Now how long is this reach? Well, let's have a look over here. There are some houses on quarter acre blocks. Quarter acre block has a 20 metre frontage. One, two, three, four, five. That's 100 metres from there to there. So from the weir, that's probably about 100 metres there, another 100 metres, 100 metres, 100 metres, 100 metres, 100 metres. So that's about 600 metres from there to there. All right, so I've got an idea. There's a reach from the weir to the bend, the significant bend, 100 metres. Uh, okay, over here, built up area to, looks like the suburbs, nothing of note, big open area there, it's not a golf course, don't know what that is. Uh, we've got high ground, leading up to higher ground with some towers up there on the peak. Um, now in reality, we would have 180 degrees or more visibility, so don't know whether this, this area here is just a saddle or whether or not it's the end of the a ridge line of high ground and goes down into the low ground. I, I, in reality, I know exactly what it is, but uh, for the purposes of this exercise, we don't know. Okay, now let's have a look at the VTC and see if we can figure it out. What's the first thing I'm going to look for? Well, I know it's in the urban area and there's a river in it. So there's an urban area and there's a river. Now I looked at some weirs. Right, there's a black weir, Gleason's weir, Alpin's weir. Actually, it should be Aplin's weir. Aplin's weir. Hmm, all right. So it's a reasonable assumption that I'm going to be somewhere around one of these weirs. So let's have a look at this one here. Does that help me? Well, not really, because that reach went to the right, not to the left. That one there, the reach went to the, uh, sorry, the, the bend in the river after the reach went to the right. This one here goes to the left. What about if I'm looking that direction? Yeah, that one might work. So am I hit, hit looking that way? There's uh, some high ground. Hmm, that high ground is a little bit too far away. So look, how far is that? Well, follow my cursor. See these tick marks here? They're one nautical mile each, which is 1,852 meters. So according to this, that's about 10 or 15, uh, 10 to 12 k's away. It's probably a bit too far. So it's not going to be that. And remember, those the towers were, weren't to the right, they were to the left. Um, so that's probably not it. What about this one here? If I look in that direction, well, this might be a bit better. There's the reach is going around to the right, or the bend is going to the right. I've got high ground, and there's the tower. Yeah, but it says I should be looking at the ocean. No, that's not right. How about I turn around? Now look, look in this direction. All right, there's the bend in the river. Okay, that distance there, compare it to that. Oh, halfway between that mark and that mark is about 900 metres, so that would be about 700 metres. Yeah, that's about right. 
So it's pointing to, oh, there's some high ground. And the high ground is moving up to some higher ground, and there's some TV towers. Right, okay, I think I know where I am. I am right there, Aplands Weir, looking in that direction. Let's have a look. Yep, I'm happy with that. That's where I am. So there's a bit of deductive reasoning to figure out where you are on the map after you look at features on the ground. Okay, this one here is pretty easy. Let's look at the features. First things first, big natural feature, a long stretch of beach. Now we have a man-made feature, a road that's paralleling it. There's a golf course there. Buildings, more buildings, high ground, and that white thing there. Then over here we have some land, and some land here separated by a stretch of water. Let's have a look at the map. So why don't you put it on pause for a second, see if you can figure out where you are. Or, if you're like most people, you figure it out straight away. There's a long bay with a road right next to it. There's a golf course. There's a built-up area. And there's some high ground, a channel, and some land, which in this case here is Magnetic Island. Uh, on top of that high ground, we have the radar site. So that was that white golf ball looking thing. So where am I? I'm right here, looking along there. Here's one more picture to have a look at and try and figure out where it is on the map. On this map here, this is Magnetic Island, so let's have a look at that scene there. Right, again, a little bit difficult. In reality, you'd obviously have the ability to see at least 180 degrees, if not more. So just looking at this scene here, we can see that there's a bay. There's a bit of a built-up area um, along Peninsula or Isthmus, and with some bays on the other side. So that could be leading to some more land or it could actually be a point in reality you'd know that it's a, a point so i'm going to tell you now it's a point so we're looking for a big bay uh, no that doesn't look right one of these ones no because there's no point there's a big bay there's a point and there's built up area i'm looking across at some more okay that's it there i'm looking right here looking in that direction Here's another picture. Have a quick look and see what features uh, you would uh, be using for navigation. Well, there's some obvious ones. First of all, there's a jetty on a bay with a point. Built up area, looks like a golf course. Uh, that point and that point are significant features and it's got a little small point in between and looks like some, some sort of built up feature there. So key items, built up area, golf course, jetty. Big point, big point, little point in between them and some sort of um, built function feature there. And then of course we've got some high ground over to the left. Right, first thing I'm gonna look for is an obvious one. Is there a, a jetty? Well, there's a breakwater. Hmm, that doesn't look right. Hang on. There's a golf course. Built up area, jetty, large point, large point, small point, and there's that built up thing. It's actually a breakwater. So I'm obviously right about there looking in that direction. So things to do before you jump on board the aircraft, you need to plan your flight. Get a brief from ops or mission coordinators if that's applicable. Have a look at the map. Do that map recce that we talked about in the previous um, slide, uh, previous modules. Look at it and check the map for uh, the route that you're going to be flying and any hazards and obstacles, uh, especially power lines that are marked on the map. So you get a feel for the terrain and you prepare your map as we described previously. You can do a fly through, a dirt dive. Uh, so you can make a mud map uh, or even 
put your waypoints on Google Earth and fly through it on Google Earth. Figure out the weather. What's the visibility going to be like? Are you flying around smoke, which means it's going to be harder to see things, so you need to be able to identify things on the ground uh, at, immediately underneath the aircraft or very close by because you won't be able to see off in the distance. Where's the sun going to be? Is it going to be low on the horizon or high on the horizon? Are you working early in the morning and tracking to the east? It's going to be very difficult to see. Figure out where your shadows are going to be for all these stages of flight. Also think about where your fuel is and how much fuel you've got, when you're going to have to refuel. Uh, payload and performance, usually the domains of the pilot, but you might not be able to take extra people on board. You may not be able to take all that big load of equipment depending on the aircraft type. So in conclusion, a few things to take away. The GNSS makes navigation easy because it allows you to use GPS receivers. However, it is easy to lose key skills in navigation. That's why we did these presentations. So get to know the key pages on your GPS receiver. Know how to figure out where you are um, on one of the pages by the present position page and also how to mark a waypoint. Also know how to change the settings, especially from latitude and longitude to MGRS and vice versa. Uh, some apps are very useful for aerial observation because it allows you to take a photograph and geotag those photographs. So if you're doing observation of, say, uh, locust uh, plagues or uh, mapping fire grounds or looking at water courses or checking dam levels and things, uh, you can take photographs, allocate a waypoint name to them and put some notes against them. And then when you're back on the ground, you can then hand that inf information over to the planning team. When you are doing some navigation and you are doing that deductive reasoning, look for the obvious and then look for confirming factors, as we just did in those last few slides. Don't bend the ground to suit the map. Very, very common mistake of inexperienced navigators. You say, oh, the river bends 90 degrees on the map, and then you look at the, uh, the terrain and, oh, the river looks like it's bending 60 degrees. Oh, that should be right. Maybe the map's wrong. No, the map won't be wrong. Don't bend the ground to suit the map. Well, that's the end of part four. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you got something out of it. For those of you who are participating in the practical component of this, uh, this course, exercise drone search will be the last module. So it's an airborne exercise designed to demonstrate and teach airborne navigation using a helicopter. And you go over such things as uh, converting a magnetic, uh, so make a converting bearings into tracks, true and magnetic, working out um, timings over the ground when you are flying through the air, and being able to identify waypoints, taking photographs, and gathering intelligence. Anyway, if you're not doing that, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, have a great day.